Welcome to the Magical Motherhood Podcast, where we gather as mothers who are actively healing our witch wound and are devoted to celebrating diversity, nurturing ourselves, each other, our families, and you. I'm Ariana Mogg, human resource extraordinaire by day, human design embodiment coach by night, pop culture obsessed nerd, and West Indian green witch 24 7. Hello, I'm Hala Kuhana, a.k.a. the Bougie Hoodoo, a.k.a. your Mississippi mystic, and a.k.a. the soccer mom sorceress. I use my head, my heart, and my hands to make magic that heals and inspires my family, my friends, and the collective. I'm Karen Lepage, sewing fairy godmother, connection weaver, possibility amplifier, spiritual modality dilettante, and professional pattern maker, focused on healing through making and expanding inclusivity in every direction, whether that's in my work, my community, or in my own heart. Erica Cullum here, a 21st century witch slash entrepreneur practicing my craft through intuitive coaching and consulting at my biz Collective Commons, while also homeschooling and advocating for justice on all fronts. Today we are talking about advice and obviously with us having a podcast, we are people who love to give advice and to an extent, love to also receive it. Um, but it really does have to be vetted through the channel, the context, the stage of your life. And as we were talking about this, so many things comes up, especially around transitions and milestones within your family and within your motherhood journey. And so today we're going to dive into what's some well-meaning advice that maybe didn't land as it's intended or that you've made better with the help of a little magic along the way. And before we do, let's go ahead and ground in this moment. Take it away, Karen. Whatever you're doing right now, please pause and let's take a deep breath together. Lay down your troubles under the shade of the mother tree and rest. We call to the four directions, north, east, south, west, to bring us together for this time and to connect us to the earth and each other. Allow your roots to ground down and connect to the unseen network of nurturing, motherly support that spans the earth. You're with countless others on this parenting journey. You're not alone. Helicu, have you pulled an oracle card for us this week? Yes, I have. Um, I love exploring this oracle deck. It's beautiful. It's the Earthcraft Oracle. And today's card is very interesting. It's card number 26, and that's about sacrifice. Um, I know this is going to resonate and track with each and every one of us because this card is calling on us to reprioritize and move some things around. Something, you know, something has got to, we've got to put something to the side or something has to go because we're feeling overburdened. Um, we're holding um, too much um, and we have to learn to sacrifice some things so that other more important goals and priorities are able to come to the fore. This card is asking us to be honest with ourselves, to be true to ourselves. Um, and it means that somewhere, somehow we've got to make a sacrifice along the process. Um, and so that may look like you know, less of a paycheck to have more time um, at home, less time at home, uh, less time perhaps with the family, especially if our littles are older and a little bit more independent and more time pursuing what makes us happy and make what makes us feel fulfilled. Um, the card, and I love this, it said this is, you know, in the little companion booklet, and I really like this because it's coming along perfectly and we're in this waning moon phase, right? Like we just had this big, beautiful, um, full strawberry moon in Sagittarius. And uh, the the Oracle is telling us that now is time to really consider and think about releasing an outdated belief about yourself. And so since we're in that waning phase, this is a wonderful time to work with that, to release, like let go. Um, what identity, um, you know, this is ego, our hologram, like what have we constructed about ourselves? Um, especially around defining what we can do and what we can't do um, and releasing that because it's, you know, we're, it's, we're not, we're not safe in that. We're not safe in that space. Um, 
so that is our message. That is our oracle. And I think it's, it's, it's kind of a cool one. I like that. I'm feeling a little strained myself trying to keep all these plates in the air. And now it's, you know, this is time the universe, God is asking us um, and inviting us to, yes, don't worry about one of them or two of them. Like if they, if they, if they fall or they go to the side, that's okay because our time and our efforts and, um, you know, I need to go someplace else and we need to prioritize um, elsewhere. So that is our card, card number 26. And it's really, I always like to show it to, to y'all. Um, I know we all have the same deck, but it's very beautiful. Um, card number 26. Thank sacrifice. you for that cue. That's so funny when we were having our little group recap, just getting together this morning. That is very much the energy that I'm in trying to spin all of the plates. And I feel like I'm not doing them well. <laughs> so. Yes, that is an excellent reminder. Okay, so let's get into today. We're talking about well-meaning advice. And I think that I know I've been on both sides of this, um, both receiving because it's it's so easy for people to I think people generally want to help and they will just tell you even if you didn't ask for it. And I think that's one thing that I've learned as a parent is to try to ask for permission before you suggest things to other parents but like Q you were talking about too like you just want to give it because you want to help so oh well-meaning advice tell us your experiences I gotta be you know I didn't get a whole lot of advice because we were we we lived so far away and my my um we lived in Utah. So my mom kind of arrived for two days just to kind of, you know, get me through the cesarean. And then, um, you know, she had to fly, fly, you know, back to back home to work and responsibility. So we didn't have a lot of I didn't have a lot of um, advice. I think Andy, my sister, gave me a lot of advice about nursing because she was the first person in our family that um, breastfed a baby. And she would talk about like how important it was. And I remember thinking, okay, I'll do this for a little while. But, and now I literally go into ecstasies talking about like nursing and how important and healthy it is for the mom. And, um, I literally want to stop if a mom's having trouble, like just to be like, Oh, you know, it's okay. You're okay. You're fine. There's nothing wrong with you. There's nothing wrong with the baby. Cause, um, so I didn't have a whole lot of that, but um, I will, some advice that I was given by my mother-in-law, and it sounds like such 1950s, like boomer advice, and especially the way she said it, because um, she loves babies and she loved coming in for like those moments, like a week or two when the babies are little. Um, some folks are brilliant, like at that stage, they don't really, they're not that excited. Like once a kid develops personality, starts being themselves, but man, when that baby is like a baby, they, they are in there, they are in it to win it with you. And I have to give that to my mother-in-law for that. Cause she was a snuggler. She was, a, I will always hold the baby. I will sit here and hold the baby while you do whatever, while you and Josh do whatever. And, um, she told me that first day and I was, you know, I'd been sawed open. By the time they get you home, the spinal block and all of, you know, whatever they've given you have for real worn off. I just remember being in such pain, but wanting to be there for the family. And my mother-in-law just kind of bustled in in her very glamorous Leo way and picked up the baby. She's like, how cute? Every morning, no matter what, you just get up, take a shower, put on a little lipstick and you get out there for your family. You can do this. And the lipstick part aside, and I did, I did put on the lipstick. Um, I was a different person. I was a different, I was, I was a little different than I actually, you know, there was still some of that old stuff that was still clinging to, but it helped. It did like just the five minutes in the shower. I knew she was holding the baby or Josh was holding the baby just to, okay, I'm in pain. I've been sawed open, but I can do this. And I would settle myself. And that was just something I still, I would still say, I would still say that to my sisters. I probably leave off the lipstick part, but, um, but I'll, I, I, I remember that it's felt cheery. It made me feel like, oh, I can really do this, even though I was in a lot of pain and I didn't know what I was doing. And I didn't have a lot of nurturing at home, make space for me and the new baby. Like, so that was, that was my first advice. And I have to be honest, it was not, it wasn't horrible. There are lots of different takes I could have taken on that, but it was good. It was, and it helped me because um, I was alone and far away from friends and family and I needed it. And I'm, I'm still grateful to her for that. I got the same advice and it helped me too. I expected to have postpartum depression because um, 
runs of my family. And, you know, I grew up with the depressed parent. And so I expected it. And so I was meeting it like, <laughs> like I meet everything, like the challenge it is. And I was like, okay, in the hospital, I have, I might not wear makeup at home, but I'm going to put on lip gloss and I'm going to brush my hair the first day. You know, you, they make you walk to go um, use the bathroom. And they won't let you go until you've <laughs> taken care of yourself. Um, and so I thought, you know what, I am just going to, I'm going to try it out. What can it hurt? I mean, it's like leaned, pressed up on the counter, trying to put makeup on and fluorescent light in the hospital. But just something about taking one freaking minute while, I mean, I didn't change a diaper till I got home. In fact, when I got home was the first diaper I'd ever changed because I hadn't really held or babysat anybody. <laughs> that was my first experience with the baby was my own. So um, having people there to take care of my baby while I took a moment to take care of myself was, even though makeup didn't have to be the thing, that was the time I set aside. And so I, um, I think it was good advice, uh, at least for me. Uh, now I'm not wearing makeup today, but you know, I didn't need it to pretend that I'm, that I've, I'm myself, you know, and not just the empty vessel. <laughs> What's interesting about that advice is you could take it several different ways and you guys both applied it beautifully. And when we think about like the capitalistic approach, it's you got to look good for your man. You got to hold down for your family. Like you cannot let them see you sweat. How dare you? Who cares if you just gave birth? But the badass, magical witch advice that I'm hearing from you guys as examples, which is so cool. It's y'all are leaning on your elements. Y'all are putting on your archetype. And I just love that you guys are able to take that advice, well-meaning as it was, and really just alchemize it into something that you really needed. And even just to be with water, like Q, I know you lean on your elements to really like set the tone for everything. And, and I'm sure you whether consciously or not, you were leaning into that. And, and Karen, like you were putting on your armor, you were choosing your archetype when you were facing the day. And it's just so cool to have so much time and space and distance between that advice when it was given and how you guys have applied it and to see you guys in your power and your magic now, because it's, it was always there. And, um, for people who are throwing a lot of advice and coming from, hopefully well-intended people, like there's always space to make it your own and to just not only just assume positive intent, but to truly put your stamp on it and say like, okay, that worked for them, but this is how it's going to work for me. Yeah. I think that's such a big deal because have you ever noticed it really depends on where the advice is coming from, right? Like we have these automatic reactions to people and that's something that I've I've learned a lot, especially like in, in coaching, but like if we are able to just kind of like step away from the emotional reactions of things sometimes and just observe what is like, what is just the, like being really like, this is, this is just information, right? It's not meant to be one way or the other. Like, what can I extract from this and make useful to me? Um, and I think Karen was about to say, and I was going to completely agree, like I've never gotten more unsolicited advice than when I was visibly pregnant. For some reason, I felt like I was walking around with a billboard that was just like, tell me your traumatic experiences about being pregnant and giving birth. Um, it's ridiculous. I mean, I had a man at the hardware store, like come up and touch my belly. And he was like trying to tell me something. I remember always like I'm gonna say a lot of white men I had a uh, someone that I worked with he came up to me and he told me he's like you know you have to you, you're you're gonna need that epidural and I was like excuse me he's like I was there I was there when my wife was giving birth he's like you're gonna want it I was like but did, did you actually did you actually birth the baby like and also that is one person's experience like I just I can't get over it. I, I was pregnant as the same time as a male coworker's wife. And it was both our first babies. And I was doing hypno babies because I was like, I'm going to, you know, 
do this naturally. I'm going to do this my own way. And him and his wife were doing um, like the classes at the hospital. And the big difference is the classes at the hospital seem to just tell you every single possible thing that can go wrong so that they can cover their own ass in case something happens and you're prepared. And so every week he was coming up telling me like all of these things. I was like, I know you are trying to be helpful and share information, but like, I just don't want to hear it. No, thank you. Um, and I think that's something too, that we can like say to people, if you start feeling like it's going in a direction where you're like, this is not beneficial to me or my mental health, you can just say, I know you're trying to help, but no, thank you. And you've also got the perfect foil to get the hell away. You can say anything. You can say, when you're pregnant, you can say like, oh God, my ear's itching right now. I have to, okay, I have to go. Like, you know, I, I can't, I can't be here for this right now. <laughs> like, and people will, people will be cool. Yeah. Yeah. Can't do this right now. Gotta go pee. Bye. <laughs> Yeah, exactly. Like just move. That is something I was never taught. And I've had to teach myself as a 40 plus, like you're a woman. When people are being shitty, I have the right to move away from that. I can just literally physically distance myself. My phone can start misbehaving. Um, you know, I can all of a sudden not hear you. Um, sorry, I didn't see that. Beautiful boundaries. Bringing those boundaries into play. Yeah. Like, however you got to do it. Oh, that, I mean, I taught my kid that very early on. My five-year-old will always be, no, thank you. Oh, no, that's really great. <sighs> I'm thinking about how much I would have liked to move away, but the trauma response, a fawn trauma response, in hindsight now, I know, didn't allow me to. I would try to make somebody else feel better and say anything I could to extract myself, except something clear, like, I'm done listening to you right now. <laughs> what are they going to do? Be insulted? Big deal. I'm insulted that you gave me unsolicited advice, but this is in hindsight now, 25 years later. Um, but yeah, understanding that we um, may also have a, a trauma response that prevents us from setting those boundaries clearly. And that can be a sign to get some help from a therapist so, because you're going to need the boundary setting and the strength um, to get through those years of parenting at the rest of your life. Absolutely. What about the best advice you guys have ever ignored? And I've lived to tell the tale I'll go just because it's like top of mind. Um, and because I have littles, I have a three-year-old and a one-year-old, but it <laughs> mine was sleep while the baby sleeps. Like, no, that's the one I may want sleep. I may need sleep. I may crave sleep, but I want to doom scroll. Okay. That's actually what I really want to do in the moment. Like I want, I want to get this impossible mental checklist done. Cause I'm not going to be able to get to my REM stage if it's not cleared off my mental dashboard. And I just want to just like watch something mindless or do something mindless. Like I can't sleep. I just need to rest my mind. Like we need to go on like a virtual stroll of a park inside my head because I cannot sleep right now. And don't tell me to sleep. It's like equivalent of someone like getting worked up and be like, relax. No, no, I can't just relax or breathe. It's like, I'd love to take a deep breath. It's unavailable right now. Do you know how to do that? In fact, I watched this goofy movie with Eric the other day. Um, it's got Channing Tatum and Sandra Bullock. So if that tells you all you need to know. And he was trying to get her, Channing was trying to get Sandra's character to take a deep breath. And she was like this overworked author. And so she couldn't do it. And I really related to that. Just not knowing that it, you need to take a breath and can't. And then he would go, what's that smell? And she would just go, it's like, oh. And that's what switched for me. So now I do that with the kids all the time. It's like, that's so cute. What's that smell? And it's so cheesy, but it works. And it's way better than breathe, relax, sleep. It's like, obviously I'd love to. There's something preventing me from doing that. But yeah, best advice y'all have ever ignored. That is wrong and not right. And no one should have to do that. And 
I hope this new generation that we're raising is going to fix that. I'm really going to put my best magic behind that because that's wrong. And also, Karen, I literally saw a flame shoot up from your head like that Pixar movie when Ariana gave that example of like when somebody says relax, like I literally saw like a flame like like shoot from the top of your head. The best advice I've ever rejected. And I don't want to take it dark because I know y'all, I did not have a particularly light and sunny childhood. But in my culture, There's this entire attitude around having an adversarial relationship with your kids. Like these kids aren't going to drive me crazy. I remember the Kings of Comedy, like Bernie Mac had this whole like, and it was hilarious, but it's fucked up. Like about, I'm not going, these kids ain't going to kill me. I'm going to kill them. Like, and I'm like, as I think about that in retrospect, this whole kids are trying to get over on you, manipulate you. If you spend too much time nurturing, caring, noticing, paying attention you're somehow fucking up and you're being duped. I have full wholeheartedly rejected that. Um, And fortunately, I was able to just kind of passively, aggressively kind of ignore it because my family wasn't that close to me. I would only have these panic attacks when my I would visit my, you know, me and my little family would like visit my family in Mississippi and I'd just be stressed about are they, you know, because my family wouldn't have been like, what you need to do with that kid, you know, they wouldn't do that, but it would be... Mm -hmm. And kind of like looking at you crazy, like when you came back in the room, like, oh, you know, she spoils these kids, like any kind of loving, nurturing, paying attention was considered spoiling the kids. And that's really macro and overarching. But I am so glad I wholeheartedly realized I was like, I can't even do that. Like, I'm not even built like that. Like my whole way of being, I'm too tender. I have too many feelings. I love being loved and like pouring love on other people, especially little people that look like me. Like how am I, like how am I supposed to do anything other than like, even when they're being a brat, like, Oh God, I guess they're wilding out today. So I, that's some of the best advice. And that's broad, that's super macro. And even though I wasn't courageous about it and I wasn't vocal about it, Again, I would just, I'm like, yep, good thing I live in England. I'm just going to pack all this up and take my little circus back. Or good thing I live in Utah or California or wherever. So that's the biggest thing. The, um, and that, I'm sorry to say, I'm so glad there's a growing community of, yeah, we don't hit our kids. That's leftover shit from slavery and colonialism. Like, why would we ever, why would we ever do that? But that's, I think the unspoken advice is be harsh and punitive and a disciplinarian with your children And that was the advice that I was like, yeah, no thanks. Yeah, that's so, so, so true. And it's kind of backward too, because on the one hand, it's like... Yeah, toughen them up so they can survive in the world instead of filling their cup so they have the resources to find their way in the world. Um, That's definitely advice I did not take, but that is not good advice that I ignored, like sleep when the baby sleeps or maybe don't go back to work less than two weeks after the baby's born. But the... um, yeah, that's so many, so many um, harsh, disciplined kind of advices that I ignored. One of them, um, though, not related to discipline. When I had toddlers, I was advised, ill-advised, but well-meaning to not give my kids choices. Um, not how I operate even now. But yeah, that was well-meaning, but definitely not heated uh, advice. I think kids need choices. We ask them in different ways, depending on their personality, but not giving them choices. Why is it my job to control them? I don't see having children that way. I was going to say something to piggyback off of what you said, but I think Karen put a bow in it. Ooh, the respect thing. I mean, I think discipline should be another episode because we've got, we've got loads to unload there. Mm -hmm. Oh my God. (laughs) brought you into this world and I could take you out of it. It's like, why is that? Like, why, why does your mind go there? Why does your mind go there? I'm curious about, is everybody like vegan or vegetarian except me? Like, that's the kind of thing that my family would have way too much to say. Curious from the young moms. If It seems like feeding the baby, cleaning the baby and putting the baby to sleep is like something folks seem like they have the right to freaking get into your business about. Yeah, my family's vegan and I have been vegan since before my daughter was born and my family had a lot of things to say about that in fact I um have seen that some of them even say that I'm in a cult (laughs) but um like before my kid was even born my mom was like worried about like what are you gonna what are you gonna mix the baby's cereal with like you know that like flaky porridgey kind of 
gunk that like I don't know I definitely ate as a kid and I like told her I was like I don't think I'm gonna feed that to my baby and she was like what and I was like I just I think I'll probably just feed them actual food <laughs> like because we did baby leg weaning we're like whatever when it was time whatever my we were eating our kid ate like we sweet potatoes and avocados and bananas and we let them feed themselves and we didn't do the airplane um and that was uh not understood or seemed very radical I think to some some people that I knew so yeah people have lots of opinions about that but um I mean my kid is at the top of her growth rate she's healthy she's fine she's yeah she's living she's eating and she's okay so like as long as we're all healthy we're just gonna keep doing what we're doing and somebody answered what is even in that cereal as i think about it now i can totally visualize it but i don't even remember what's in it what's in it it's flaked rice <laughs> it's like dehydrated like cooked and dehydrated rice again it's supposed to be easy to digest why not just give them rice Okay, because I remember mixing the breast milk in it. It's fortified. Okay. Yeah. Fortified. I it's fortified. It's fortified. It's fortified. <laughs> okay, all right, all right. It's got, it's got extra stuff in there, you know. Okay, okay. I remember mixing okay. the breast milk in it, but I don't even remember. I don't, I'm like, what? Right, because I can totally imagine that flaky, weird, gray texture and mixing the breast milk in it, but I don't, I was like, as you said that, I was like, what? Yeah, why wouldn't we just free... Yeah, yams and avocados and bananas <laughs> and actual rice. Like we can mash up actual rice. Um, anyway, I just thought I'd ask that. That was a, oh, I haven't thought about that rice stuff in, in a decade. I remember making that for my siblings when I was younger. One of the things we wanted to discuss too was advice that we've made better with magic. Something that we kind of know to be true or that actually worked for us and advice somebody gave us, but as our witch powers and skills have um, condensed and intensified, is there anything, any advice that we made better with magic over the years or that we plan to make better with magic since we, we got young mamas? I will say I'll score one for the patriarchy. My father-in-law gave some of the best advice um, when my daughter was born and he said, just remember the baby comes to live with you. You don't go to live with the baby, meaning like acclimate the baby into your house your lifestyle and don't like bend over backwards right like trying to this the whole idea of like be everything do everything you know like if you don't want to have to tiptoe around your house for the rest of your life then like just teach your baby to like live with some noise or you know like I think a lot of times parents are so because we love these little we love these little squishes right and you want to do everything you can for them but also like remember like you also they came to live with you like they picked you as their parents um and so like let them be a part of what your life is like and not try to recreate something because you think that's how you should do it and that's something that we've been um has been the best advice and that I think as me individually and as my family you know just grows and evolves and you know gets more into our our, our magic um, that's been really fun to explore and build upon. I have to say mine is also in line with that, Erica. Um, when I was teaching, there was this line where you had to accept responsibility. And they would always say, teacher actions, student actions. And it's like, oh, well, shit, when you put it like that, like, in what way was I acting a fool? I had all these fifth graders acting a fool in the classroom, right? Like what environment or tone was I setting or what was I allowing or what was I giving or not getting that this, you know, this ended up happening and just derailed the class. And I've really taken it into like into our own household with, with our, with our kids and um, thinking about like parent actions, child actions and the magical additive that I that I've put on there is just like I make sure that magic's kind of like at the forefront of of what I say and what I talk about like 
in the morning, I like to greet the oldest with like a book that he really likes to read in his bed, because I know like if he starts his day with a full cup, like he's going to have such a better day. And for the youngest who's still in our bed, like we get up and we just, we just stretch and, you know, I'll light a candle if I feel moved. Um, we'll just look at the sun. We'll just find animals outside and just fill their little, their little love containers up. Cause I'm just like, Oh yeah. Parent actions, child actions. And, um, how do I want to ease into my day and what are magical ways for them to ease into theirs? Like, cause they each have different interests and in being respectful and mindful of that too. And even when we're eating things like, and I got this from another magical mama that I, that I really enjoy. And, um, it's just like, the way you talk about food and, and how you're ingesting it and saying like, yeah, I'm, I'm going to have some water because I'm feeling a little achy and I really want my powers to be turned on today. Things like that. And just making sure that I'm being a conscious role model, a conscious magical role model for them and not just telling them what to do or what their options are, but explaining why I'm choosing things for my own self too. First of all, just the idea of raising little humans and especially these little boys, like with someone, the first thing they see in the morning is my mom knows I love this and she cares about me and this is how I'm starting today. I have so much hope for this new generation. <laughs> I do. I have so much hope for this new generation. Like that's so beautiful. Um, one of the, I don't know who told me this at the very beginning with the littles, with the girls, just to bring them in the bath with you. Like this whole, like you need a plastic tub and you got to go through all these and all this insanities to bathe the child. Like you, I mean, cause the contraptions and stuff that we have for children and like that, like it's like, I don't even know how they've evolved or iterated. And I remember being told, um, bring the baby into the bath with you. Can you imagine the kind of bath, spiritual bath, like as a just full, like me being a full grown witch and hoodoo, like I could have with my baby. I can't even imagine my nephew just sent me a video of the little baby, Andy Rose. And you know, when you first pour the water over the baby's head and they're like, like, what is this? Like, you know, I just remember like, and they had a video of it. I wasn't able to take a video of it, but I immediately remember what that was like for Hallie and Reese. Like that, just that cup of water and just the warm water, like going over their little crown chakra. Like, can you imagine like what's happening? So that's something that, oh my God, if I had a baby right now, the bath adventures me and that baby would have are like just the different... Can you imagine bringing Rosemary now, like knowing what I know about Rosemary and the power to connect to like grandmothers and spirits, just what that would even be like, like in the bath. I can't even freaking imagine right now. Like it literally in my mind, I'm imagining my husband with like, just like Hallie on his chest, like in the bath, like how beautiful I can make that for them now. Um, I can't do it now. I have to save it for like my grandchild or like when the, when the, when the girls have their own children or with Andy Rose or something, I can, maybe I can do it for her and Andy, like when, you know, the baby comes to visit, but that's something I, I could take that advice and make that more magical for sure. Well, we could talk about this forever, but in the interest of time, Maybe, um, Halle Q, you could pull us a card so that um, we could have something to contemplate throughout our week. And maybe we will post something in our Substack um, so that people can discuss what they do, uh, especially around baby bath that is made more magical or kin keeping, community keeping, or self mothering. Yes. And as I pull this card, I'm going to give you all the words of my grandma Myrtle. Um, when it comes to this advice that everyone's going to be getting and, and y'all, the advice never stops uh, as these kids, um, as these kids grow up. Um, and you're, I hope you never stop seeking advice because I'm asking everybody I know whose kids have flown the nest, right? Like, or gone off to college. I'm just like, how did you handle it? What are you doing? Like, I'm, that's another thing to do is to be proactive too. Like you could always cut off other people's questions by asking, like <laughs> asking your own questions. Um, so there's that. And let me pull a card for us. I pulled one earlier, but it didn't seem right. Like I was like, okay, that didn't feel right or seem right. So I'm just... And I think that main spirit was like, why did you pull it before the show even started? Like, why did you pull it when you're supposed to? Why did you pull it when you're supposed to pull it? So here we go. Wow. Okay. 
This is the nine of cups. We're doing a good job. We are, no matter what generation we are, whether we're a millennial, whether we're Gen X, um, or even, you know, um, if, you know, we've got boomers or kind of older folks listening to this generation or seniors, because we're in a different stage of nurturing, right? Like maybe we're grandparents or aunties. This is the nine of cups. This is um, emotional health. Good relationships, good connections. Um, imagine a banquet table um, and you're welcoming people into your home and each cup that's on that table, so it's nine cups, is full to overflowing. These represent our friends, our values, the, you know, our family that we choose to keep close to us because they align with us and the way we do things. The friends that we have cultivated, our family of choice, our, our connection to ourselves, um, the way we're, the way relationships are flourishing in our family, we're good. Our banquet table is full. We have a lot to share. We have a lot to be proud of. Um, you know, and that's why we invite people in. This is to me, this is a sign of real emotional health. And, and if not, even if you don't feel like it, you got some good things, um, going on. We're almost at a 10, um, you know, build, building the family and the, the emotional and relational like connections that we deserve, that we're meant to have, that we're, you know, we're responsible for bringing in. I'm really proud that the nine of the nine of cups is the happiest, is one of the happiest figures like in the tarot. And to me, I can't help but feel like I want to extend to everybody, to our, our moms, our aunties, grandmas, like anyone that's nurturing and loving young people and bring magic into it. We're doing a, we're doing a good job. Um, the fact that we're even, you're here and listening, trying to grow, be in community and evolve so freaking important and um good job keep it up all right so that's what we got nine of cups heck yes and i think that ties in beautifully with the oracle card from the beginning with that sacrifice that we we can put some things down right like taking care of our health means not trying to do everything all of the time so there's there's some more well-meaning but maybe unsolicited advice um but if you're listening to this podcast that's what you wanted i suppose so with that said, before we close, let's take one more deep breath together. You can breathe in support, energy, and encouragement. Breathe out whatever's weighing you down. You got this. You're not alone. This season, we'll be talking about things like how to curate your village and being a multidimensional parent without becoming a martyr, plus so much more. So please subscribe, follow, favorite, and share with the moms or maternally curious folks in your life to be with us right from the beginning and never miss a thing. Find out how to connect with each of us individually and sign up for our mailing list to get instant access to our five favorite spells for the family. Just sashay over to magicalmotherhood.club.